So in my last video, I briefly mentioned that vampires in anime are so ubiquitous that vampire anime is practically its own subgenre. Let's expand on this, shall we? While all signs point to Dracula, Sovereign of the Damned being a mild hit for Toei on Japanese television, quality of product be damned, You have been revived solely for the purpose of destroying your own father! <laughs> it didn't really set off a vampire craze in anime. Sure, you had Vampire Hunter D five years later, but vampires in anime, by and large, were rarely, if at all, the focal point. Vampires either playing the roles of bit characters or monsters of the week in some larger plot. Don't crap your pants if you see a vampire out there. This began to change somewhat come the late 90s. Being that fantasy and supernatural anime were all the rage, anime centered around the mysterious creatures of the night began to pop up with titles like Vampire Princess Miyu and Nightwalker. But then the new millennium hits. All of a sudden, the doors were blown wide open and the vampire became a common fixture in anime of the 2000s. Not a single year went by that there wasn't an anime featuring at least one bloodsucker as protagonist or antagonist. And it was easy to do since, because the vampire is such a flexible supernatural archetype, the vampire anime could easily be any genre. You had dark fantasies like Trinity Blood, theatrical romantic dramas like Vampire Night, cutesy romantic comedies like Karin, saucy harem comedies like Rosario Vampire shown in action fair like Black Blood Brothers. And let's not forget the absolute king of 2000s vampire anime that rose above them all, Helsing. The vampire anime craze eventually ran its course come the early 2010s, likely a victim of the industry-wide sea change that took place when a little anime called Sword Art Online aired exactly a decade ago. When Isekai took the throne, vampire anime was kicked to the curb, only living on for the rest of the decade under the umbrella of the mid-decade Monster Girl craze. There has been some coming back, but as of the time of this recording, it's doubtful it'll ever be back to the levels it was in its heyday. But it's still far too early to chit-chat about a subgenre's downfall. Instead, why not talk about how the vampire anime craze of the aughts came to be? I personally have a theory that what really kicked off the craze in earnest was two movies that came out in the year 2000. Both of these movies were high-budget affairs that involved vampires, and they got noticeable acclaim among film critics overseas. And, at a time when the industry was gearing for more international appeal thanks to America's anime craze, it was figured that vampires were the key. The first was Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust, a big-budget sequel to the 80s film helmed by the legendary Yoshiaki Kawajiri, doing what many considered to be his magnum opus. The second one was a lot smaller, only clocking in at 48 minutes compared to Bloodlust's girthy 102 minute runtime. But it had a similar budget attached to it, and depending on what circles you ran in the year 2000, this was one of the biggest films that year. As far as we know, she's the only remaining original. Original. In the year 1966, a mysterious girl boards a train and, out of nowhere, assassinates the only other passenger in the car with her. This girl's name is Saya, and she is a hunter of a very special type of creature known as Chiropterans, a species of bat-like monsters who disguise themselves as ordinary people and live off the blood of humans. Because they are so durable, the only way to kill a Chiropteran is to land a massive lethal blow on them so that the large amount of blood loss completely negates their healing factor. The only one who can do this job skillfully is Saya and her mastery of the sword. Operating under the United States Task Force Red Shield, Saya is given a new mission by her handlers. A Chiropteran has infiltrated the American Yokota Air Base, and she needs to go undercover at the high school adjacent to the grounds to lure out and kill the beast. 
Saya being a professional and having no time for school shenanigans. Are you Japanese? Konnichiwa. Leave me alone. Is expected to get this job done as quickly as possible. She only has a few days before the monster goes into hibernation and becomes untraceable. Lucky for us, it shouldn't be a problem for someone considered to be the last original. 2000's Blood the Last Vampire is an anime whose title never fails to itch the back of my head. The level of my anime fandom in the early aughts was just me trying to catch Toonami every day and searching the internet for Dragon Ball screen grabs and Digimon fan art, and even in those days of me barely scratching the surface of the surface level anime fandom, I still heard talk of Blood the Last Vampire. Blood the Last Vampire, in the infancy of my otakudom, felt like the most important film. The way people from all corners of the internet hyped it up as this game changer for the medium. Even when I got older and started reading more periodicals by animation historians and critics, Blood the Last Vampire still managed to come up. Flash forward to 20 years later and... Nothing. People barely bring up Blood the Last Vampire or the franchise it spawned anymore. It's practically a footnote in anime history now. And that's a mystery to me. Blood the Last Vampire didn't appear to be a victim of overhype. If anything, considering the pedigree behind it and its release at the height of the anime boom in America, it seemed like it got the right amount of hype. Or maybe it was though. Maybe people were just so wrapped up in the fervor of its cutting edge production style and animation that they overlooked that it might not actually be all that good. Whatever the case, this is a mystery that needs to be solved. Was Blood the Last Vampire just another victim of the sands of time? Or did its legacy crumble to dust when exposed to the sunlight of critical analysis? Well, we got all night to figure this out. Or half an hour at the most. You know how these videos go. To start with how Blood the Last Vampire came into being, we return to a reoccurring guest on this show. Yes sir, this is yet another big time anime project that would not come to fruition if it hadn't been for the stray dog of anime himself, Mamoru Oshii. In 1996, Oshii, having just finished Ghost in the Shell, decided that he had been in the industry long enough that he needed to give back in some way. In spite of his decade and a half of experience up to that point, Oshii had never really been a senpai to someone. He had never mentored anyone to pass down all the knowledge he had received from his years of experience and from his own mentors. So, at Production IG, he began the Oshi Juku, a series of lectures to act as a cram school for new animators in learning how to create and pitch new ideas, as well as learning how to direct those ideas. And while Oshi did partially create the Oshi Juku as a means to kill time between projects, it still ended up producing some talented animators who we'll get into later. Fast forward to a few years later, and Production IG's president, Mitsuhisa Ishikawa, wants the studio to do another big budget project. But this time, not based on any existing anime or manga series. He wants a wholly original concept. So he went to Oshi and he asked if some of his students could submit some of their ideas for an anime movie. Out of all the submissions, the ones that became the basis of the project were Kenji Kamiyama's and Junichi Fujisaka's submissions. Kamiyama had been in the industry for a couple of years at that point, serving as art director for OVAs like Burn Up and Genocyber. Fujisaka, on the other hand, was a complete rookie, Production IG being his first gig as an animator. What they submitted was just a singular image, a girl in a sailor suit wielding a katana. A simple idea but one that nevertheless grabs one's curiosity. From there, the concept of Blood the Last Vampire was slowly hammered out throughout many meetings between Oshi, Ishikawa, and the rest of the Oshi Juku. Ishikawa even suggested that the setting should be around the Yokota Air Base, citing its unique locale as the state of California within Japan. Now there was just the question of who was going to direct. It couldn't be Oshi because at the time of production, he was busy trying to get the green light for his own little passion project. Enter Hiroyuki Kitakubo. Now wait, you might say. Hiroyuki Kitakubo is an odd choice for this kind of dark, edgy, blood and steel style horror movie. After all, his most well-known work prior to this was Golden Boy. Why him? 
To answer that question, you need to know that Kitakubo had been lobbying to helm a horror project for quite some time. According to American expat animator Jan Scott Frazier, who had been working at Production IG at this point, Kitakubo liked to finagle tickets for press showings of American films premiering in Japan. One of these movies that he invited Scott Frazier and Ishikawa along for was the movie Seven. A gruesome psychological thriller that relied heavily on tense atmosphere, Seven ended up having a profound effect on Kitakubo. We went and saw Seven and we didn't know what it was. We just walked in cold. The film blew Kitakubo's mind. That totally fixated him on doing something with an atmosphere like that of Seven. So he had that in his mind and he said, I'm gonna do that with blood. So we got our concept, our setting, our main character, and a director to bring it all together. Let's make ourselves a vampire movie. The big selling point of Blood the Last Vampire was that it was billed as the first digital theater animation. In other words, this was to be the first theatrically released anime film done entirely in digital animation. Digital animation wasn't exactly new, Disney had actually been doing all of their animated films digitally since 1990. But the anime industry was full of traditionalists, and it took a while longer for them to go from traditional cells to the digital framework. But Production IG really wanted to take this next technological step, Oshii in particular since he was one of the early adopters of merging computers with cell animation. So Blood was going to be their galleon by which this team of animators and directors were going to explore this new ocean. According to Kita Kubo in a chat log he did for Sci-Fi.com, possibly the most year 2000 citation I could give, he said that the entire digital production did make things move a lot quicker than they would have if they were done the old fashioned way. However, this being the first, it also meant that the team really had to grapple with learning the ins and outs of the new technology and the foibles that came along with it. This being the main reason why, despite having a two year production cycle, Blood only clocks in at 48 minutes. I really wanted to make it longer too, but because of hardware slash software issues with computers we were using, it had to be 48 minutes. I'd rather have a completed 48 minute work than an uncomplete 90 minute movie. But the thing with technology is that it's always going to be improving and what might have been cutting edge will look positively primitive 20 years down the line. So the question is, does Blood the Last Vampire hold up technically? The answer is yes. Kind of. I won't lie, some of these shots reek of the PS2 era, but the rest of the film still looks good. The 3D backdrops are given enough depth and texture so that they feel like a lived in environment. The camera work is dynamic and grants more freedom to the kinds of boarding Kitakubo wants to do. And most importantly, the lighting and color timing fit the horror atmosphere this film is trying to go for. There's a lot of deep shadows that are colored in intense blues, reds, and oranges to really give you the sense of fear throughout this film. And even when scenes are done in the daytime, the light feels completely overcast or so washed out that it feels artificial. It's all there to give you the sense that nowhere in the setting feels safe. And is the heavy use of low light just a means to hide the monster designs from view because the more you focus on them, the more you realize that they're kinda underwhelming? Possibly, but that's just my theory. I could talk about the action animation, which is, of course, a major selling point in this film. Most of which we can thank animator Mitsuo Iso for providing action in a very humanist way without undercutting the spectacle. But that would not be made possible if it wasn't for the god tier character animation on display. The characters, despite their incredibly stylized designs, feel like actors on the screen with how they move and express emotions. There are so many little subtleties you catch that make the characters come alive. Their movement when they walk into a room, their sweats perspiring on their brows, the fear in their eyes when they scream, etc. Even in silent scenes with little animation like this scene of Saya doing detective work, you can feel the gears turning in her head behind those icy cold eyes of hers. Going back to those stylized designs though, because I would imagine they might be deal breakers for some. What with their caricatured features, scratchy line work, and heavy, heavy lips and all. These designs were the product of Katsuya Terada, an artist who was more known in the world of video games than in anime, his most famous credit being the one who did the gorgeous concept art for the Legend of Zelda series. Kitakubo wanted this man specifically. 
I personally think Tarada's character design work fits because it emphasizes the setting of this being on an American Air Force base, quite possibly the least racially homogenous part of Japan. The designs are supposed to emphasize the internationality of this location. And even the Japanese locales are characterized to a degree that fits their personalities and professions though some might find some of the designs a little too characterized. <laughs> yeah, no comment on that. But the internationality of Blood the Last Vampire isn't just limited to the character designs. <laughs> So for those of you who clicked on this video and are just now learning about this anime for the first time, would it shock you to know that there is absolutely no English dub for Blood the Last Vampire? What the hell is this outfit? Well, I'm not sure. It's supposed to be a Japanese high school uniform. Yeah, all of these clips you've been watching so far, they are all from the singular Japanese version. Production IG was known for being more globally minded compared to other anime studios at the time. They worked closely with Western distribution companies and had non-Japanese animators on their staff. This gave them a unique perspective in how to distribute their anime and what they could do to really reach a more transnational audience. So they opted to make the characters bilingual. Not just having the American characters speak English, but also having the Japanese characters speak English when talking to English speakers and speak Japanese when talking to other Japanese. No Tekken rules of language here. Kitakubo had worked with this concept before of using both Japanese and English voice tracks in the same anime with the Robot Carnival short A Tale of Two Robots, his skewering of imperialist World War II era propaganda having heroic yet incompetent Japanese speaking heroes duel with a stereotypical English speaking villain. I will not allow anyone to alter the course charted by my peerless intellect. And they also get some real deal English voice actors in the roles like Joe Ramersa as Saya's handler, David. Sure, he's more well known for his music work and all his best known roles in anime are bit parts, but he does a good job here. I'll have your school uniform and ID ready in the locker by then. You better read through the file carefully. We know there's more than one of them. Hey! Hey, Saya! But then we get to the Japanese actresses, Yoki Kudo as Saya and Saimi Nakamura as the nurse character who accompanies her. Their roles are the primary Japanese characters who have to speak both Japanese and English because of their respective occupations. It should be noted that both actresses can speak English, Kudo because she's a fluent speaker and Nakamura because she's Japanese American. And I enjoyed chopping all the monsters with a sword, <laughs> so I hope you would enjoy too. And for what it's worth, their Japanese voice acting is naturally well done. <laughs> but then you get to their English and... The sword's getting dull. It's not sliding out of the sheath as smoothly as it should. Yeah, something's off. On one hand, their voices are coming in loud and clear. On the other, they are clearly reading their lines as opposed to saying them. There's a stiffness to their voice acting that really takes you out of the movie. We could chalk this up to having these two actresses being primarily screen actors who have zero experience voice acting. So their rigid acting shows us that they are clearly out of their wheelhouse. The modern animated blockbuster problem. Or we could chalk it up to the ADR mostly being directed by a Japanese crew and the potential language barriers that come with directing English speaking voice actors regardless of the actor's nationality. The 90s Capcom game problem. Don't come this way! No! Either way, it just highlights why this voice acting decision ends up hindering the final product rather than helping it. I know, the man that was with us, she called him David. Doesn't he work in this building? You would know what happened. Where is he? But, wouldn't or not, the voice acting is small potatoes compared to how this anime actually fares as a piece of horror. At first glance, Blood the Last Vampire could just be seen as typical classic exploitation theater. After all, the film's most striking image is of a seemingly teenage Japanese girl in a bloodstained sailor uniform wielding a katana. Ishikawa himself said the image was very much emphasized purely to get the otaku crowd on board. But Blood the Last Vampire is so much more than that because 
thanks to Kitakubo's direction, it manages to be a really effective horror anime. First, you have the mystery of who could possibly be the assumed monster in the area, which delivers the everyone's a suspect brand of suspense. And when the monster actually does reveal itself, it turns out that there's actually more of them. Compounding this is that when Saya kills the first monster, the sword, which she complained about it being too dull in the beginning, ends up breaking. This is troublesome since katanas are difficult to find, even in 1960s Japan. And the one she does find ends up being a fake. So Saya, our expert vampire slayer, is without a weapon for half this anime. To make matters worse, this whole incident is taking place during a Halloween party on the base, so Saya is having to be extra careful to keep casualties to a minimum. We also have the secondary protagonist in the Nameless Nurse character, who serves the purpose of being the helpless audience surrogate caught up in these events. Some people might find her annoying and superfluous, but you should thank your lucky stars that it wasn't an annoying male standing character like they do nowadays. She's a character that really conveys the terror of being an everyday person caught up in these supernatural events. A scene where the horror element is executed best is when she's following the blood trail left by the wounded Chiropteran and soon discovers that the beast is on the crowded dance floor. Kitakubo knows how to do horror. It's not surprising considering the research he did for directing this film. From reading Bram Stoker's Dracula, to watching the then-hit American TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So it's even more disappointing that there comes a point where the film runs out of steam and stops being a horror. Once Saya's handler gives her a replacement sword, the movie's over. She slays the other beast and hunts down the final one in a decidedly average chase scene on a runway before it can escape on a cargo plane. And after a brief epilogue where the nurse character is interrogated and has her silence bought, the film ends. Kitakubu might say that this is a completed 48 minute movie, but I don't know. This feels like an incomplete part of something. Or to be more precise, this feels like an extremely expensive pilot for an anime series rather than its own movie. Saya, despite being our main heroine, isn't all that fleshed out. She's presented as a cold professional killer and nothing else. The only real insight we get from her character is that she's the last original, meaning that the vampires she's hunting are just mutant variations of pure vampires and that it's implied that she is considered to be the last one who has pure vampire blood in her veins. An aspect that's not really shown. She can walk around in the daytime without too much trouble and doesn't appear to need blood to survive. The only hints we get that she's not fully human is her having an unnaturally long lifespan and the fact that religious symbols upset her. And that's it. The movie just leaves us hanging with regards to more information on Saya and her being the last vampire, a reveal that's treated like a big twist ending despite being given away by the title. Oops. According to Kitakubo, the movie was meant to be Act 1 of Saya's story, and Acts 2 and 3 were all written in his noodle to be expanded on at a later date. A decision I understand considering how this movie was more of a testing ground for new animation tech so they could only have so much story in it, but if you were hoping to build a legacy spanning franchise off of this movie, that decision might have ended up costing production IG in the long run. Production IG's decision to make Blood the Last Vampire an anime film with intercontinental appeal thanks to his bilingual voice cast was a gamble that paid off. When it was shown around film festivals, it received multiple awards. It won the Public's Prize Best Asia Feature Film when it debuted at Montreal's Fantasia Film Festival. It won Grand Prize at the Japanese Agency for Cultural Affairs Media Arts Festival for Animation. Kitakubo won an award at 6th Animation Kobe for his directorial work and it was selected as the best theatrical feature film at the World Animation Celebration. Critics and audiences alike responded very favorably to this film, especially in the early days of the online blogosphere when this film hit. The glowing review of it on Anime News Network was the page with the most web traffic for 15 months in a row after it was uploaded, and cultural criticism website PopMatters.com made the bold statement of Blood being the standard to which all adult-oriented animation should rightfully aspire. Beyond critical success was its financial success. 
For Blood the Last Vampire's distributor, Manga Entertainment, it was the fastest selling title in the company's history, selling over 120,000 units in just its first month. Some people have credited its success to the limited theatrical release it had, and the entire film being streamed for free on the early VOD website Sputnik 7, showing that it was just not technologically innovative as an anime movie, but also as a distributed property. So why, with all of this critical and commercial success, has the anime become such a historical footnote 20 years later? Well for starters, I think once the hype for the anime began to die down in the mid-aughts, I think a lot of the same criticisms I had with this anime started coming to light. Short runtime, the bilingual voice track not really working, underdeveloped cast, you get the idea. But at the same time, narrative criticism has been levied at other entries in the anime canon, and they still seem immune, so what gives? I think it could have something to do with the narrative not only being underdeveloped, but also shallow. Mamoru Oshii was a major player in helping Kitakubo and company craft the story, but even with his involvement, the story of Blood the Last Vampire feels very un like Oshii is a guy who adores themes in his story. To the point where a common critique of his work is that their thematic elements often suffocate the narrative. But Blood the Last Vampire is unique in that it has very little in the way of themes. The only theme you could conceivably grasp is the feeling of being a Japanese person who's an outsider in their own country, whether through vampirism or being a native working on the United States base. And also some things about this being the eve of the Vietnam War, but those are depths that go unplunged, and even if those themes do exist, they are all just window dressing. You might call the themes of Ghost in the Shell navel gazing, but they have at least kept the film a topic of conversation for 25 plus years now. But I think the biggest factor is that if Blood the Last Vampire was supposed to be the first step into a major franchise like Gits turned out to be, then it didn't really exactly capitalize it in the best way it could. Going back to Kitakubo's comment on Saya's story, that storyline was continued, but not in anime form. Saya's story continued on in the form of a manga, light novel, and a PlayStation 2 game. The manga sequel was released overseas, but as far as I know, it didn't exactly set the world on fire because manga was still a lot more niche compared to anime in those days. Only the first volume of the light novel series was released overseas, but in 2005, when not only had the blood hype died down, but also when light novels were barely a known concept in American anime fandom. And the PS2 game, despite having the production IG team come back and do animated cutscenes for it, never got a release overseas. Of course, we can't forget the spin-off series, such as 2005's Blood Plus, a 50-episode anime that feels even more forgotten than its predecessor despite having aired on Adult Swim, and 2011's Blood Sea, which was a massive commercial failure that Production IG still tried to pump a lot of money into despite that. And if anybody remembers it, it's probably for the wrong reasons. Gratuitous acts of senseless violence are my forte! You're such an adorable urchin, Max. And then there was that live-action remake in 2009 that Ronnie Yu of Freddy vs. Jason fame produced that was a critical and commercial bomb. Boy, it's amazing how much franchise material Blood the Last Vampire spawned and how little it has to show for it. Anime's own Jurassic Park. But it could also just be as simple as Blood getting lost in the vampire anime boom it helped create. By 2010, we were swimming in vampire anime that was doing what Blood did, but better, and it might as well have been just another face in the crowd. In short, Blood the Last Vampire's legacy was killed by its initial success. A true flash in the pan anime, if there ever was one. Now would I recommend this anime? I mean, if you really want good technically minded digital animation that's so drenched in 2000's core attitude that you're shot that it doesn't have a new metal OST, then by all means, track it down. But at the same time, you should keep in mind that a lot of Blood's hype back in the day was exactly that. Just hype. It's not a bad anime by any measure, but it can only really be a just good enough anime. If it wasn't held aloft by the best power players at Production IG, then this video would be a lot harsher in its critical assessments. In a way, Blood the Last Vampire did earn some of the hype thanks to Kitakubo's, Oshi's, and Production IG's efforts. But hype, like Halloween Night, eventually has to come to an end.